i don't try to be cinematic but it just happens that way because i write visually because i write in scenes with as much dialogue as i can use because i i love dialogue and i think that's the way to bring the character out let's hear him talk see what kind of a person he or she is so you make movies huh i produce feature motion pictures no tv but everybody gets a chance to reveal himself, to show himself in his attitude, in his reaction to what's going on. You know what else? I'm really glad that you rejected me 10 years ago when I auditioned for the part of Eddie Solomon, the pedophile clown and birthday boy. If I'd have gotten that part, I might have been typecast. <laughs> and that makes it attractive, I think, as a movie. Rough business, this movie business. I may have to go back to Loan Shark and just to take a rest. <laughs> One of the other great things about Elmore's book, uh, Get Shorty, is the sort of relationship between Hollywood and mobsters. It's a good combination. They both work on threats, fear, and sort of intangibles. I thought it was funny that a guy like Chili, who was a loan shark, could come out to Hollywood and feel right at home. If there's a theme, that's it. When you put artists and criminals together, they have one thing in common, is they both want freedom from something. But the only thing they have in common is they want to be free from someone stopping their creations and gangsters free from someone stopping them doing bad things. So when you put gangsters with, with artists, uh, it's funny. Chili's a gangster, ran a club I used to play at for another gangster back in Miami. How is Momo these days anyway? Dead. Bummer. I'm on my 40th book right now, and out of that number, about 30, I would say at least 33, have either been optioned or bought outright. But once it's optioned, there's a tendency to emphasize the action rather than the characters. Barry Sonnenfeld, when he did Get Shorty, he was the first one to realize that they are the important elements in the movie that once you get to know them, the story will come out of them. That's the way I, I wrote books for, well, 30 years before I hit the New York Times bestseller list. So that's just a Ted Stringer. No more Leonard at home. <laughs> before we started the movie, he and I went and had lunch, and he sat there telling me all the stories about how all of his books had been screwed up as movies, just one after another. Just go from one story to another about how this book was turned into a horrible movie and that book was turned into a horrible movie. And all I could think about is, I'm gonna be another story at someone else's lunch. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end, when he got up, he shook my hand and said, well, have fun. <laughs> on, Once I got to know Scott on the set, then uh, we talked about it and, you know, compared notes. And uh, he, he used as much dialogue as, as he could from the book. He was enormously helpful in terms of me figuring out what the movie was about, just talking to him and talking to him about the characters. And he was, he was a huge help. I couldn't have written the script without having those conversations, even though he'll say, that's not true. I didn't help at all. No one can believe that my first choice for Chili Palmer was Danny DeVito. But for me, the Chili Palmer character is about a guy who has ultimate self-confidence. And Danny DeVito is that guy. Danny doesn't seem short, doesn't act short. He has a sense of self-confidence that takes any of that physical size away from him. So I wanted Danny to be Chili Palmer. He was prepping Matilda, a movie he went on to direct. In fact, the reason he decided not to be the John Travolta character was because he didn't have enough time to be that and to direct his movie. So he took the title role, Shorty. I, I thought about it for a second. I said, look, there's, there's probably somebody better to play that part of Chili Palmer. And uh, so I kind of talked him into looking at other actors to play the part and only because I thought it would be better. We went to John, and John read the script and turned us down. One of the producers on the show knew Quentin Tarantino and called him and said, you gotta help us. Tarantino read the script, 
called John and said, John, this is not the one you turned down. Originally, I turned down Get Shorty because the script wasn't uh, reflecting enough of the, of the book. And then uh, Quentin Tarantino, who really wanted me to do it, he said, well, why don't you just ask if they'll put things from the book into the script? And I wasn't used to that that kind of authority to do it. But uh, I went back and they did say that they would indeed put back from the book whatever I wanted. The whole scene where I'm watching a movie within the movie was something that I wanted in. Uh, I remember there's one point about the description of my leather jacket being from Alexander's. Where's my coat? It's not one of these. Well, do you see a black leather jacket? Fingertip length like the one Pacino wore on Serpico? Because if you don't, you owe me $379 many different moments like that where I just felt that that Elmer Leonard had captured the the detail so maybe you didn't see the sign I seen the sign but I didn't come to sunny Florida to freeze my ass off you got that so you either find my coat or you give me the $379 that my ex-wife paid for it at Alexander's he missed that and uh, I think there were a few other things that that were sp specific in the dialogue that he missed that he felt made it real Travolta is fantastic as Chili Palmer. He looks great. He walks great. I think he was playing James Bond a little bit. Literally, even without music, just walking towards us in and out of light, lighting a cigarette, you thought, this man is a movie star. You must bring something heavy to the deal. I do. Me. It was a great role for John. It was the kind of role that I think that if it wasn't cast right, that the film wouldn't work at all because you needed somebody who had the kind of strength and also somebody who could kind of convey a small boy's delight, if you will, about this new and kind of exciting world that he was exposed to. Harry Zim. Jesus Christ. How you doing? I'm Chili Palmer. Oh, Jesus. If I have a heart attack, I hope you know what to do. Chili has a sense of fairness and a sense of justice uh, his approach to that fairness and justice may be unorthodox, but I think he has an innate sense of, of that. Who knows whether it's moral or not. <laughs> I trust you, Chili. I think you're a decent type of man, even if you are a crook. Chili's too honest in the sense that when he tells you what he wants, he's telling the truth. Whereas in Hollywood, a lot of times people tell you what they want and you're not quite sure if that's really what they want or if there's something else going on look at me harry i'm looking at you i want you to keep looking at me right here well that's what i'm doing chili will tell you exactly the way it is you know when he says look at me chili means look at me and tell me what's going on inside of you leo look at me leo i'm here to save your ass how by taking my money he did have a great stare. It's the kind of person that when you, you look at them, you, you pay attention. And that's why he wanted to get people looking at him. Because once they looked at him, they knew he was serious. Martin, look at me. I am looking at you. Now look at me the way I'm looking at you. Put it in your eyes. You're mine, asshole, without saying it. Well, the reason I remember the look at me scene with Danny was because I had been warned the night before that it was eight pages of dialogue and that we were gonna film it in a master and I had to know every bit of it. Well, I didn't sleep one wink that night before, memorizing every word and I just, and Barry liked it letter perfect. He didn't want any alterations. It was, uh, I don't know, six in the morning and I had to leave in like 20 minutes for the set and I hadn't slept, I was still memorizing the lines. So eight pages of dialogue all night until I nailed it and I was still memorizing it in the car I was memorizing in the dressing room, getting made up. And it wasn't until I sat down in the sofa and Barry yelled action, did I completely know it? And the first take was perfect. Look at me. I'm thinking, you're mine. I fucking own you. What I'm not doing is feeling anything about it, one way or the other. You're just a person to me. Just a name in a collection book. That's all, just the guy who owes me money. Understand? Cut. Great, very nice. But it had taken the whole eight hour from midnight till 8 a.m. to really get that down. And I think my certainty on it made it funnier because 
I just uh, knew how to play with this uh, Martin Weir character. I knew it like the back of my hand by the time I got to the set. First conversation we had about the movie, he said to me that I think Chili Palmer needs to be a real movie buff, that he really needs to know movies. He doesn't know the movie business, but he knows the movies themselves, and he's spent a lot of time in the movie theater. There was no Miss Vargas. I was just to turn you around. He is captivated. He's reciting to the screen the dialogue. That's the second bullet I stopped for you. That's the second bullet I stopped for you. You're going down, Orson. I think it's such a great moment in the movie because he's suddenly not the cool guy and he's just a kid watching what he loves. That scene with John watching that movie is one of the most uh, engaging things I've ever seen in a film. The, the look that he managed to get on his face and the things that were, he was feeling as he was watching that film were absolutely terrific. Really good. Yeah, you know, Wells didn't even want to do this movie. He had some studio contract he couldn't get out of. But, you know, sometimes you do your best work when you got a gun in your head. You can't be completely straight in this business. I think that Chili is honest. He's a straight shooter. She's not used to that in Hollywood. And he's childlike in his honesty, in a way. She can see that he's, he's absolutely pure and she likes that. I think it's refreshing for her. Well, why would anyone want to be in the movies? Yesterday, you were a loan shark. Yeah, but I was never that into it. Well, no, this just might work out. You never know. It's just might. I said to Scott Frank, we need an example of something that shows how much self-confidence Chili Palmer has dressing a certain way or, you know, wearing a certain kind of tie or Nehru jackets. But all that stuff would just make him look goofy. And I said, let's give him a really bad car. Let's give him a minivan. What is that? It's an Oldsmobile silhouette. I ordered a Cadillac. Because he is so self-confident, by the end of the show, everyone thinks he's driving that minivan because it's the coolest car. And in reality, the reason is, is because it was the last car on the lot. And Scott Frank wrote that great line, which for a little while became sort of a phrase. I mean, it is a Cadillac of minivans. Oh, yeah, check this out. Wow. You mind if I take it for a spin? You mentioned grotesque before. That happens to be grotesque part two that Karen Flores was in. She also starred in three of my slime creatures releases. I called Gene Hackman and said, we'd like you to play Harry Zim. And he said, I can't do that. I said, why not? He said, well, it, it's a comedy. I don't do comedies. I said, well, that's the great thing. Don't, don't be in a comedy. Don't play it as a comedy. Play it as reality. Let the audience decide it's a comedy. Yeah, I always have reservations uh, about getting caught acting. Uh, and, you know, that's a good way to do it if you're in a broad comedy and, and you're not, and it's not working especially. Uh, then you're, you know, you just look like a guy trying to be funny. <laughs> I once asked this literary agent uh, what kind of writing paid the best. He said ransom notes. Ransom notes. Here it is, Mr. Lovejoy. I don't know what coaxing went on behind the scenes to get him to take the part. I know he never thought he was good in the part until he saw the movie. He was always kind of unsure of himself and didn't think he was doing a great job, and he was nailing it. I mean, hysterical. Assuming I go along with this, when could I have the 500 grand? Whenever you want. The money's in one of those jock bags and $100 bills out at the airport, just waiting in a locker to be picked up. At the airport? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I... What's funny is that strange juxtaposition between extremes. And here's this guy you just know down deep from his whole history of movies. It's tough playing this guy who's completely running amok. Operator, uh, let me have uh, Las Vegas information. Harry, let me give you some advice. You don't want to act like a hard on you standing there in your undies. I think you, you'd, you have to go with your instincts and with your training. I never have worn a nose. I don't need, need that. I've got a funny nose already. 
But uh, I, know, I know that Olivier uh, liked a lot of makeup, the prosthetics and things like that. I, I don't because I, for me, it, it um, I don't know, it just, uh, uh, it inhibits me in some ways. The teeth were fine, you just snap them in there, you know. I, uh, had these wonderful teeth that um, seemed to work for me. And, and uh, oh, the look, I, I suppose the, the goatee and the mustache is his way of saying he's an artist, that he's uh, a little different. I knew a guy when I first went to Hollywood, an agent, and I, I, I couldn't tell you his name now, but um, he was the phoniest human being <laughs> I'd ever met in my life. <laughs> but, but funny and delightful, you know, but he, he couldn't say good morning without lying to you. You know, he, he was just one of those people. And a real show busy kind of guy, and I, I kind of tried to pattern this guy after him. I needed a half a million dollars to buy a script, a movie script. Blockbuster, but quality. No mutants or maniacs. It's going to be my driving Miss Daisy. He was, you know, the king of the B movies, maybe even C movies. There was a lot of those kind of guys, producers and would be directors and writers that, you know, just hold up in Hollywood hoping to get a break. Harry, I think your investors are here. Oh, Jesus. There's a great scene where Bo Catlett and his sidekick are coming to get money from Gene Hackman that he owes them. And Travolta convinces Hackman, just say nothing, let me handle it. But Hackman cannot keep his mouth shut. Let me put it this way. Outside of freaks, it's none of your fucking business what we do. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, here it is right here. This, this is the project, Mr. Lovejoy. Mr. Loveboy, well, what is it, Harry, a porno flick? No, no, it's fluff. It's, uh, you wouldn't be interested in it. You think we go to see your movies, Harry? I've seen better film on teeth. <laughs> no one in Hollywood can just shut up because everyone needs to hear their mouth talk because then they think they're, like, in charge of stuff. What? Maybe I wasn't clear, but I thought I told you to keep your mouth shut. You asked me to get these guys off your back. And the next thing I know, you're saying, oh, have a piece of Mr. Lovejoy. I, I, I couldn't believe my fucking ears. I told him that I would think about it. In this town, what does that mean? Nothing. Oh, he's really good to work with, Gene. He doesn't work at night, but he's a really good guy to work with in the day. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I've worked with him again since, and uh, he's a good friend now. And, uh, you know, he's very responsive, very cooperative, and uh, very tough. Uh, as long as, you know, the sun is still up, Things are fine. You know, it gets a little dark. Mm -hmm. Who is it? Me. Oh, fuck. I heard that. Hello, Doris. Harry Zim. You look like a wet kiss. Mmm. Mmm. -hmm. Yum. Well, aren't you going to offer me whatever it is you taste like? I love Bette Midler. I asked Bette to do the part in, uh, in Get Shorty. It was a real gem of a role. She said, uh, you know, Danny, I'll do it, but you're gonna owe me for the rest of your life. I hate being alone. The house is so quiet, so lonely. It needs a man's touch. Nice necklace, Doris. Yeah, that was fun. I think I got to kiss her, and uh, we go back a long ways. Bette was brought in, I think, almost like an extra. And uh, be because she was so good, the character just got expanded. Harry, you want me to go? Just say so. <sighs> what the hell? I don't think there's any actor in the world who would pass up working with Gene Hackman. And, that's, and those scenes were terrific, and she was terrific in the movie. Every day, same time, they come down here and have breakfast. Two-time Academy Award nominee, Martin Weir. This Martin Weir? He's gonna play the mob guy turned snitch in Cyclone. Yeah, one of his best parts. No, well, the best part was when he played the crippled gay guy that climbed Mount Whitney. Yeah, uh, right of clouds. Good picture. Martin's completely full of himself. When he started out in this business, he wasn't, and he just became a movie star. And any honesty that he had or any simplicity just went out the window. I'm sitting here, I'm looking at you, I'm having flashbacks of memories of us. 
Really? How did it go wrong? How did it all slip away? Well, it didn't slip away, Martin. You did when you went off to fuck Nikki at my birthday party. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was a good party. You're an actor. Actors like to pretend, right? We've been known to make believe. A serious actor can, like, sometimes be a pain in the ass because he's looking for something. He's like a dog after a bone. He's trying to get the, you know, the right intentions, the right motivations. I mean, he's unfortunately put in a situation with, you know, people who are pretty much bozos. Oh, Martin, for Christ's sake. <sighs> really, the true actor underneath is always the victim. Well, what do you, what do you... Look at me. What? What I'm thinking is, you're mine. I fucking own you. But what I'm not doing is feeling one way or another about it. All right. How about this? Ooh, wow. Oh. Not bad. Mm. Not bad. Mm. No wonder you're Martin Weir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was a huge actor in the book. If you're going to believe it, the guy should be right now everywhere. You know, the way movie stars are. You know, you should just see his face everywhere on bus stops, billboards, Rolling Stone. Everywhere you go, it should be Martin Weir so that you really understand the fish they're trying to hook is huge. I decided it would be a really funny idea to give Danny some other movie that he had just been working on because then I could have posters and billboards and, and Scott Frank came up with this wonderful notion of Danny DeVito as Napoleon. We rented the biggest billboard in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard and put up this fake poster of Danny as Napoleon. Martin Weir as Napoleon, right? It was all over the place, everywhere you went, on kiosks and on, you know, bus stations, and it was kind of, you know, bizarre to get, you know, to walk in and have people think you were playing Napoleon. I got a lot of phone calls, <laughs> you know. Danny, you got a lot of balls, you know what I mean? But <laughs> What happened with Danny is when he and I would read the script out loud, what we would find were these great moments. We would constantly find great moments for humor, and particularly with the girlfriend he was living with and the whole thing about the party and, you know, and you went off to sleep with so-and-so, Nikki at my party, and yeah, that was a great party. That all just came from sitting around and reworking the script. But the movie star issues were all there in the book. I felt we needed to show how powerful Danny DeVito's character was. And the way you do that is by how far you can go off the menu. He doesn't even look at the menu. He doesn't even modify something on your menu. He asks them to make something totally off the menu. Hi, what's your name? Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, I feel like an omelet. Can you make an egg white omelet but with shallots, with the shallots only slightly brown, very little olive oil, and no salt? OK, why don't you bring one to the table? We'll pick on it. No. Yeah. Have... I do that. I, I do that all the time. We go to the party for the premiere of Get Shorty. The kids said they wanted hot chocolate, right? The lady said, we don't have hot chocolate. And I said, well, you got a hot fudge sundae, right? She says, yeah, 